is the is that when we get into this um, this talk about the witch phenomenon, it's not like this is kind of like the like the Medusa tattoo, right? It's a way of reclaiming the word witch itself is colonized. It something that lay healers, lay women around the world for time immemorial have been practiced at the art of healing. And this is a, um, sorry, people are still coming in. And so like these lay healers would have never called themselves witches. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Me too. And, uh, um, and so what we're going to get into then is, um, you know, this week is going to build on next week, which is colonization, which is going to build on the week about um, white supremacy and voodoo narratives. And so like they're all going to have this kind of interconnectedness. And this is where the rubber hits the road. And so like this is where um, I think it's fascinating in that I've been able to meet and greet. I've been studying this my whole life. I mean, I don't know about you all, but like I, Wicked Witch of the West and and Glenda, right? And like all of these ideas of witch, like it's just always been fascinating to me. Um, but first and foremost, now that we've got a couple of people here um, that were from in the Milan breakout rooms, and sorry if I'm sort of like, you know, the horses left the barn and we should just move on. But I just wanted to touch base and see if anybody, let's see, Cynthia, Ada, Juliana, Madeline, if you, anybody wants to say anything about uh, the Mulan unit or talking about, you know, the breakout room questions. Does anybody want to touch on anything before I keep going? <laughs> okay. All right. So we're ready to move on. Okay. So this is like, I'm going to show you, like, there's a lot of bibliography in, in um, the class bibliography. I've got a lot of literature to support, like, a lot of what I'm talking about. But I'm going to show you some of these books. This is a brand new one that just came out. I actually haven't read a whole lot of it. It's translated from the French, right? And it's like, why are we still beating up Burning the Witch, right? This is a book I got when I was traveling abroad last year. And it really is, this is what we're going to be focusing on today which is the disciplining of the woman's body. It has to do with all of this crazy art that came out about 500 years ago at the development of the printing press. This book I absolutely love. It's called Women Who Fly. And it looks at all of these different, this female imagery story myth about you know goddesses witches mystics angels all of this stuff and what i find is the more patriarchal the society the more they condemn the female who can fly the more stricture the more con constraint that there is on their freedoms which is really interesting this is a book that came out in the 1970s and it's actually been gotten a little bit bigger but it's a perfect little tome and for any anybody who's studying nursing and anybody who has a friend or relative studying nursing this is a book you are really going to get want to get uh, i first read it obviously many many years ago it's very short and it really talks about the political struggle that ensued 500 years ago when women were healers oh what's it called it's called mid mid oh, sorry witches midwives and nurses and it's a visual sweep of this early modern era that comes out of Europe and that kind of transfers into the submissive nurse that we created out of the American uh, Medical Association, right? The only way women were really allowed back into medical practices was to be completely subservient as nurses to the doctor, always. And even if you can see like a lot of midwifery practices that are available today that are part of, you know, whatever medical stuff, they usually have a physician maybe not always a male anymore, but they always have a physician that oversees the midwifery practice. So it's interesting just when you start to see these little, I don't know, these, these structures that are still in place. This is the one that kind of blows a lot of people away. This is called Eve's Herbs. We're gonna talk about a lot of this on Thursday. And this talks about how women as lay healers have been employing and utilizing birth control, that is, abortifacients as well as preventatives in herbal lore, whether it's a pessary that you put in the vagina, or whether that's some kind of herbs that you're taking that will stop a pregnancy. This has been going on. It was well established thousands of years ago and really relevant through Alexandrian, Roman, Jewish libraries. I mean, it was just a given, you all. 
This is a book that I absolutely love called Caliban and the Witch. Sylvia Federici is, um, she's really the one, and we're going to talk about this a lot on Thursday, because this is where we really see this intersection of oppressive practices and early ca uh, capitalism and how these practices were created, developed in these witch hunts. And then they were they became a template for oppressing other groups as colonization, right, as well as, as enslavement and all these other practices started going on around the world. This is an amazing book. She is a, a, like a great writer that talks about like, you know, the myth of the housewife and that kind of thing, women's domestic labor. This is the last book I'll show you now, but I do have more. And it's called Ronald Hutton. Ronald Hutton is this really cool dude. Here, I'm going to show you a picture of him. He, look at he, he's a mighty fine fellow and he's like oh can you see it sorry there we go he's like a scholar at oxford and he's one of like the top brass when it comes to like really understanding the, the witch colonization of the witch um the idea of these traditional pagan practices of the spring the you know, the, the planting and the harvest seasons and all of these ancient traditions that have been left over for thousands of years that were not easy to eradicate, as we're going to see. OK, but before we get to a lot of that, today is kind of the st <laughs> is the starter point. Um, so if anybody does want to bring up something about Milan or something, I feel like I hate that we had to kind of get cut off from that a little bit. So those are the books. Does anybody know, you know, if we look at the witch phenomenon, usually as they say it occurred, this started in Europe and occurred for over 400 years. That was like the, you know, the, the most intense practices of it. So from like the 1400s to the 1800s, does anybody know two large events that happened in Europe in the late 1300s? It's happened more often than that, but we've got two big big events. Well, one of them has to be the plague. Yep, the Black Death, exactly, right? Uh, 1378, maybe, something like that. Yeah, thank you, Kat. What's another thing that happened? One of the other um, big, yeah, go. Like, the whole, like, big, like, do I have my brains? Oh, what, like those great awakenings, like, like the whole like big like self institution does that come with it or that come following after? Like I know like with the plague you have like you have like you have like well with the, after the plague you had the whole Renaissance era but and like that whole like redefining like what Christianity was and like those three like the spiritual awakenings and stuff. So like would that be going along with it? That's really good. Yeah. Well, I'll. I'll... We'll touch on that. And that definitely is a component. Thank you, Miranda. I, the other thing I was kind of looking for is there's a, around, you know, the later Middle Ages and what is the Middle Ages, 5 to 1500 AD, you have this time period of, of the peasant re revolts. The peasant revolts are really important because what you're starting to see is, you know, the peasant folk or the, the common folk. They're little by little having their land taken away from them. But that that's something that I'm going to, again, I'm going to put on the back burner for Thursday, but I want to just sort of plant it there. There are so many events happening and swirling around us 500 years ago that they all contribute to the witch hunts, believe it or not. And the Black Death is something where, you know, and if somebody wants to do their final or they want to talk more about it or develop it, like we really do see parallels, right, of the Black Death and with what we experience with COVID and the idea that, you know, when the Black Death happened, that at you know, first they just thought it was about a third of Europe that died or whatever. And, and so like there were more than possibly half of the people in Europe may have died from the plague. I mean, basically people got really paranoid after that and they really thought that everybody was going to die. I mean, they thought everybody was going to die. They thought it was the end of the world, right? They thought even better, and think about your conservative thinkers today, they thought God was punishing them for doing something wrong, right? It's happened over time before, right? So let's go ahead and I'm gonna jump into our, um, <laughs> I'm gonna jump into our slideshow for today. I'm gonna do a slideshow on Thursday too, because there's so much to cover. And Thursday's when we'll do our breakout rooms, okay? Today's pretty much just to talk about- You mean Wednesday? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you for the clarification, Alicia. The next day we meet this week, Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. So let's share a screen. I want to also say, oh shoot, hang on one second. It's not showing up for me. No, it's not there either. Where'd you go? Let's see. Okay. There we go. Okay. So as you can see, I, uh, Miranda, Andrew, can you see the slides? Great. Okay. Thank you. So essentially, um, the first thing I want to make sure you all know is two really important things. And that is, um, I'm going to say it again. Sorry. Huh? I guess I like to see you all. So one is these people, right? And we're just narrowing it down to this very narrow thing called women right now would have never called themselves witch right at this time period they also they were what we would call empiricists does anybody know what empiricists hi Ada. does anybody know what, what empiricists are empiricists are people who utilize the five senses think early science to be able to taste and to smell and to feel and to listen to be able to test herbs and plants right for healing to lessen pain to and this is going right up against the church teachings at this time to lessen childbirth to all of these things are coming together where only God supposedly can can lessen someone's pain through prayer. Only God should decide how many people, uh, women, or how many children women should have. And that also comes back to the uh, the Black Plague, right? If you've decimated over half of your population, now you don't have a lot of like lower totem pole kind of peasant workers to do the work for you. And yeah, so there's a lot of going on where you've got to repopulate. You need to have as many children as possible. So we do know all the studies show that when people choose to parent, it is actually better to have this separation in terms of how many years or months are in between childbirth. It's better for the whole family. If you're like, if you're able to plan your parenthood, it's just a thing, right? science okay now we're going to go back so remember how do you that. spell empiricist oh how, it's, how do you spell it? it's e m e as an egg m p i r i c i s t empiricist right so then you've got all this writing going on 500 years ago like hobbes and and other people saying they would rather be healed or cured by a a, a um by a mid midwife a midwife wasn't just somebody who caught babies. A midwife was somebody who really had charges or rounds all over the man the manor, the township, whatever you want to call it, right? The other thing I want to tell you all right now that I want you to write down, please, is that nothing about what I'm talking about this week has to do with the Salem witch trials. And if you use the word Salem in your paper, I will dock points. <laughs> the Salem witch trials is an aftermath. It is a leftover. And the crucible and all the stuff having to do with it was actually very racialized. And we're going to talk about Tituba in the next couple of weeks, right? Because the, 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 her, you know, the hysteria and the frenzy of the little girls and all that, this is, it's like, remember that's that story the crucible it's not what we're talking about right now we're talking about a set of circumstances we're talking about a complete refiguration of a social structure and i'm just going to read this one thing that the brilliant sylvia federici had to say about the witch to kind of take us back in the witch is the embodiment of a world of female subjects that capitalism had to destroy the heretic, the healer, the disobedient wife, the woman who dared to live alone, the woman of color of African or Caribbean descent who poisoned the master's food and inspired the slaves to revolt. So we're talking about a restructuring. What we're going to see on Thursday is it didn't just have to do with the medical community. Women were also being persecuted earlier as heretics because they were part of these churches that still let women lead. <gasps> right so so much of this everything we're going to be talking about is a gendered event a very gendered event okay let's go back to our slideshow so one of the things that's fascinating up to me that one of the things first things i learned is and again this is about that book i showed you uh wicked bodies uh disciplining the woman's body is this idea that um you know by 1500 
most people, unless you were very wealthy and part of the nobility or the church, most the bulk of the of the population who were people who were poor were illiterate, meaning they could not read. And so they had to have, you know, churches were interpreting Latin for them. Um, and then they were, you know, they certainly might be able to pick out a couple of words or something, but the bulk of at the end of the Middle Ages in Europe, of Western Europe, mostly, people were not reading. So when the print now, there was another printing press in Asia. I know, I'm sorry, I'm not giving cred to that earlier on. But the printing press that we know that was developed by 1486 or something like that, we might think that the Bible was what was most printed, but unfortunately, that's not really true. One of the things that became used more and more was this argument of, of um, the printing press being used as a mechanism because, again, people couldn't read, but they understood imagery. And the imagery used in the printing press was specifically tied to targeting women through misogyny and being able to like take down reputations um, all through the printing press. So there's a this time period where you're seeing artists of the time being able to create art. You know, we look at, think about little wood blocks and potato skins with little carving and stuff like that. And there's, um, and they're using it. They're all being filled with the sense of great fear. Fear at this time is driving so much because people are, you know, the plague has happened. The plague is still going on. There's another huge one coming in the 1600s. And people believe that before in the Middle Ages, in the Middle Ages, the devil was a gnat. The devil was a bunch of little devils. You could say a prayer and that, that devil would go away. But by 1500, the fear had grown so much so that they believed that the devil was now this huge sexualized beast. And he was coming after the vulnerable population. Do you remember your Christine de Pizan coming after the, that very vulnerable population that women were more vulnerable to evil influences than men were? men were stronger, therefore, whatever, blah, 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 right? The whole, the whole litany of that Eve succumbed to the apple. All this, this is, is this idea. And then it gets into this horrible ageist rhetoric that older women, their wombs are cold and it's only the devil that can warm them. But that was really written. They really talked about that in church, okay? <laughs> All right, so one of the first things that was printed was the um, Malleus Maleficarum. I don't know if it, who else, whoever has heard of this before. It basically means the hammer of witches. It was something that was majorly printed. And it was written by these two guys, Kramer and Springer. One of them was sort of a, a priest. And it was basically the how-to book on how to go find, interrogate, as in torture, and, it, as in, and then try and execute witches. This is a very gender event as i told you so we're talking about 400 years even if we're talking about you know 600 deaths a year in one village that's still or sorry in one area that's still two deaths a day not counting sundays right so like we're talking about something that really was happening on a regular basis they used to say it was a couple of million women that were burned at the stake that was kind of a, a too big of a lofty number and so what they what they do think now is it's probably between 50 and $100,000. Isn't it sad? Sorry, dollars, sorry. I'm just looking at a dollar sign. If between 50 and 100,000 people. And so they were mostly, the first it was mostly older women. And then it also was younger women. Again, anybody who was, um, anybody who was vulnerable. So the Malefic Macarum was written by the Catholic, Catholic clergyman, Henrik Kramer. And uh, it was written in 1486. It became the premier book on demonology in the 15th century. Um, this is a very famous, um, very famous artist named Albert Durer. I don't know if you all have heard of him. He very inspired. One of the things, if you start to look, and this might be on the quiz, so it's important to see some, understand some of these details. This details, like of this, 1497 might be the date, but oh. Uh, O-G-H means, oh, God, help us. There began to be this paranoia of when a couple of women started hanging out together. So a circle of women was threatening 
right? The, um, this women, they're, they're kind of giving each other like these looks and it's, um, um, so, but the message of this becomes sexuality, beauty, desire are a threat to men, especially when they come together as a group. So these are part of early woodcuts, by the way. They were, for, you know, around 1400, they were engraved for the use of printmaking. And, you know, they would do it on their own before the printing press. This was a thing. They would, but there were like difficulties using the scraps of wood between the lines. And, you know, the danger, the lines were too thin or too thick or they'd break under pressure. So the rubber stamp and the potato print are familiar forms. And then, um, and this is also what um, the newer designs of the woodcut began to be produced by elimination, cutting away everything except the lines. Um, they served these illustrations for the new books that were coming out. And the demands of the book illustration caused the medium to become more sophisticated. So Albert Durer was a German artist, and Germany is where a lot of the, uh, the witch burnings really kind of got rooted, got started. Um, let's see, uh, okay, go on to the next one. So you start to have these more and more. Remember, there was no, there was no paint, the paintings that are portraits. And you think about how things were done in honor of nobility or honor of the Madonna Christ child. And then, yeah, we do have Botticelli's Venus and stuff. It's all within this context and it's not for the everyday person who can't read. So you've got this, these kind of, um, what am I trying to call it? These narratives that are created from um, like spectacle, narratives that are created from, um, from this being able to visually stimulate the imagination. This is erotic material, y'all. So here it is, like, even though everybody's so God-fearing and God-loving, in a way, it's really hypocritical, right? You're showing this very stimulating, and I'm sorry if some of this stuff is going to be a little bit triggering, this, this visualization. So in a way, it's very, it's like for, a, for groups, for a group of a culture that's never seen pornography before, you can imagine what all of these visuals are doing. Is it spiking? What is it doing? It's uniting these ideas of sexuality and fear and spectacle, right? Okay. So, you know, the witch was understood as a reversal of normal ethics and practices. So the, so you look at her, she's riding backwards on a goat. The cupids are symbolic for the hag's love of the devil. It's all about sexuality, y'all. The storm brewing in the background, it shows that witches had some control over how to bring about the elements or the weather. And the imagery is quite different than what's going on right now at this same time period at the Renaissance, where female bodies are being depicted as aging and ugly. This is, again, tying the older woman to evil, all right? You see this again and again and again. Um, here's uh, the uh, picture of Grian. Again, I think that, I think he also might be German. The witch's Sabbath, and you have, um, oh yeah, this one's, oh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, which one is this tied to? Yeah, there's so much sexual symbolism here. See how she's got this pot of her potions, which is all creating all this magic, and it's coming from between her legs. And you've got this gloomy forest scene. Nature is not of God. That's what this is trying to tell us, right? Women go meet in the wit, they meet under the full moon, they meet in the woods, they don't go to church, right? So it's starting to also, as it's taking down women, it's taking down the sacredness of nature. The origins of magical work are it's from abstract writing into these visual senses. So lots of like this is kind of like literally cooking up devilry. And here's a close-up of it. Okay, this one's tied to, we think it's Venezano, and um, it's a naked hag on top of a skeleton. I'm sorry, you can't see it. Oh, here we go. It's on top of a skeletal carcass of a monster. It's showing her the powers of the witch. Her breasts, they call dugs, and streaming hair show the perversion of women's young beauty. Age equals evil. Disney makes a fortune out of developing this concept, by the way evil through ageism. 
The, um, the image stem, stems actually from an ancient sarcophagus. Uh, Bacchus, the wine god, is like on this procession of joy, making music with the animals and all this. Here, we have a promenade to hell. It's pretty freaky, isn't it? You also have, if you look at, um, this was a, a book called Vices and Virtues. I think it might have been a chap book, like a little a little book. And you start to look at the vices, right? What is vice? It's, you know, it's envy, it's gluttony, it's yada, 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 represented as ugly old women. So the old hag has snakes for hair. Does that sound familiar? God, how old hat is that, right? She's eating her own heart. The others in the picture down here are fighting over something that she has instigated. And then um, this was a very popular book, by the way. Envy is what is where most witches are motivated. They are envious of others. So therefore, they will cause women to miscarry. They will cause breast milk to turn sour and they will swap changelings as in fairies for newborns. A judge named Hugo Grotius wrote in Latin um, the verses that went with this image. A squalid, ugly woman who feeds on viper flesh, eats her own heart, whose livid eyes always ache, who is thin, pale, and dry. And so let's see, now we have, it's, it's kind of more of the same, right? Remember Eris with the throwing the apple? Oh, is that that one? Yeah, that's this one, I think. Um, or was that that? Hold on. Sorry. It looks like she's throwing an apple there. No, maybe it is this one. I can't remember. So basically, um, it's this um, stoking the fire of discord with, uh, with her little bellows. That's what she's doing here. And so these are just a couple of more showing women with in circle with these devils. I'm not going to tell you too much about what trot interrogation looked like i think it's um just would be just too um too much to share but i think you all could imagine what's what's involved uh if you've watched any game of thrones there's some of that but they're looking for basically any kind of marks that might be freckles because they believe that they are marks of the devil they also believe that they are extra nipples in order to um uh, breastfeed their familiars which are usually in animal shapes so Goya, boy, Goya, whew. Um, he, wore, he liked to work on a lot of irony. So this one's called The Pretty Teacher, right? Um, and let's see, is this 15? No, you're not quite yet. Um, you can kind of see more here. Okay, this is interesting. This one is uh, Jacques Degas, uh, Witches in a Cellar. This is this guy was obsessed with witches and, and black magic. By the way, that's a racialized term. We're going to talk about that in a couple weeks. So he attended a newly established university, all including in the field of study of natural history, astronomy, and anatomy. He had this fascination with science and counterbalancing it with the wild invention of occult practices so lots of horror imagery making monsters out of devilish parts does that sound familiar remember frankenstein some of those ideas started here during this era this era of horror the era of the early modern era so you can kind of see how these witches are making with their their brew they're utilizing like different body parts um yeah so i think Oh, and that's more of a close-up here. You can kind of see it. Sorry if it gets a little pixelated. Um, and then this is just a couple of more. So now we're getting into something where, um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this on, um, on, on Wednesday. There, I found, I did it. I would have been here Wednesday, don't worry, even if I said Thursday, Wednesday. And this is this, this whole new kind of like uh, campaign to um to abolish the midwife so you know as i'd said earlier there used to be just midwives everywhere everywhere because even if you weren't reading you were able to you know have knowledge passed down to you from your foremothers or you you know there's you know some kind of um of, of knowledge shared right as a matter of fact the word gossip used to be god mean god's kin and the network if you remember when we studied this idea of um of the of, of storytelling and the 
the stories of social justice and the stories of cautionary tales, how they were wives' tales, right, aka Plato, who said, you know, this is how information was shared in his domestic sphere, domestic fears among women. Well, little by little, right, continuing use, using these targeted campaigns and these narratives about women can't be trusted and women then therefore not trusting each other, people not trusting a woman's word. So little by little, you've got a breakdown of lots of older established structures like that of the midwife. You've also got this rise of the universities where unless you're a very wealthy woman, um, you, you know, maybe you were somebody like a Christine de Pizan, most women could not afford to go there and they were squeezed out. So it would have been wealthy, trained, fancy physicians who didn't know anything, who in those first few hundred years of the university were only using prayer or writing Christ's name or leeches. So there's a whole campaign to eradicate the, uh, the midwife that's used through the brochure. This basically is saying, look, it's got um, an angel here Look at this angel. The angel is pushing this new physician forward to heal this man, and he's barring the midwife from, from attending to him. So you've got this whole, like, it's all creating this, this, these doubts and fears. And not to bring it too much to, you know, Hillary Clinton, but if you've ever, like, watched the arc of her journey, from day one, since she said, you know, she's a lawyer and she's saying, what do you want me to bake cookies? That did it, right? And she wanted to get involved in healthcare and like she wanted to do all this stuff. And once she was demonized, it was a character assassination that she's never come back from, not really. And so it's the same kind of thing here. Keep telling people something sooner or later, they'll believe it, okay? So that's basically one of the things. Uh, make sure you remember this for the for the quiz because the brochures that were used. Again, you see how powerful the visual is, how powerful the image is. Um, this is a book, uh, one of the demonology book called The Discovery of Witches. Yeah, I know. There's a modern uh, fiction by Deborah Harkness, I guess her name is. But The Discovery of Witches was written by this gentleman right here. And you can see, oh, when was this written? It might have been written, sorry, early 1600s, maybe. Um, he was considered the witch finder general. And he was kind of like let himself, ooh, Kat's nodding her head. Okay, I'm going to want to hear from Kat in a minute. I'm almost done with this. But basically, I love this name, Pie Whacket. These are these like the different animals that supposedly, um, you know, that. So, so what are we doing? We're demonizing nature. We're demonizing gender. We're demonizing the animal world, right? Because nothing is holy except God and his heaven. So now we've taken the idea of sacredness out of the planet completely right? Remember, look at the rise of the Indo-European, right, onslaughts. And now you've got the sky god who's now taken this extreme approach that anything of the earth is, is questionable. And it's only through God's grace that food grows, that people heal, that anything happens. Um, here's just another picture from it, I guess. I don't know. I don't remember exactly why I have this up here. Um, just some more pictures. Oh, yeah, this was about um, 1643. Yeah, this was about, um, you know, again, a specific woman who's being described as a witch. And then, yeah, it's after the brochures and everything starts to fly because somebody's printed a brochure about her, then the witch hunt comes. And so there's just another... Um, another printing. And then I have... Um, there's some of my sources. But I have some... Um, I have more if you want to see them. <laughs> and you know what's really cool is there's plenty out there. I don't know if you all have ever noticed that. There's like so much in the way of information, um, but not gives a lot. I don't think we get a lot of detail about um, about some of the, the truths behind the formation because we're still, this is the argument, right? This is the argument that we're going to be talking about this week of why are women paid less? Why don't women own as many um, as much land around the world? Why are we in a patriarchy? It's it we we. This is the week I want us to little really dive into why we take so many things for granted, or we scratch our head going, I know this is that isn't right, but why is that? I want us to be able to go deeper. Um, cool. So, cat. 
you were nodding your head. I'd love to hear what you all have to say. That's my lecture for today. And like I said, for folks who came in just a little bit ago, we're definitely having another lecture on Wednesday, and then we'll do breakout <laughs> rooms after that. Next week is our colonization week. There is going to be a direct, it's something called a boomerang effect, a direct relation from this week's unit into the next one and into the next one, um, which is when we get into voodoo narratives. Okay, so Kat, share with me what you got. Um, well, when you said which finder general, and actually on the page, I think I even recognized one of the names. If anyone has read Neil Gaiman's Good Omens. Oh, I love Neil Gaiman. Um, okay. It's hilarious because the whole concept is that the main character, um, whose first name I am forgetting, but his last name is Postifer. He's the very last in a long line of witch finders. Oh. And he, and he, he comes across this guy who is like, uh, he calls himself a witch finder general. And he's, and he's the only one, but he has this whole army of fake um, witch finder generals because he sends it off. There's somewhere in England that he sends it off and they send him money back. So he's got like witch finder doorknob and witch finder <laughs> tea kettle. <laughs> and then he runs across someone named um, um, Anathema Device, which of okay. course is considered a, a witch tool in you know the canon, who is the last descendant of this massive, um, this really powerful witch who is also a great suit, um, like um, Nostradamus, but actually right. Um, and she has the book of all her predictions and it's predicting the end of the world. And that's because there's this kid who's the son of Satan and he gets, he gets switched in a crib. It's like all of the, um, tropes of witchery are all, all, are all together. passed together. Um, and he was supposed to be raised by this order of, of covenant of nuns that worshiped Satan <laughs> and did this big Sojuru thing. But one of the nuns is really stupid. So that it gets him <laughs> to the wrong family. And he, so he's raised like a normal boy. And so he just like thinks everything is cool and wants to have fun. And then, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse come riding and they're looking for him. and. Everything's about to like go to hell, but I, I won't spoil the ending. Okay, good. I'll, I'll definitely check it out. But Very it's cool. so hilarious. And like, and so when it came to the wish finder, whatever, I, I just like immediately flash back to Good Omens because it's such a good book. They made, um, I can't remember if it was a movie or a short series about it, and it was done so well if you want to do the shorthand version thank you okay cool awesome. thank you i just just wrote it down and i love neil gaiman so much i mean yeah look, i mean yeah <laughs> thank I, you i'm Matt. so i'm so mad that the version of um what's what's the other big one about the gods that are here in america oh yeah um gods and heroes gods and heroes or american gods american gods they were doing a new series of that and they canceled it halfway through right as oh um, i didn't know that oh yeah they canceled it halfway through right as odin was hanging himself from the ash tree again like right in the middle of the book it got canceled that's ridiculous maybe i know be some kind of better uh findings you know or sorry some better uh maybe there'll be some better um funding wouldn't that be cool right i hope so i don't know it was a showtime piece so maybe Netflix or someone will finish it one we'll day. Pick it up. You know, worse things have happened, but yes, well, fingers crossed, they will pick it up for sure. Thank you, Kat. Okay, so a couple of things. Anybody else want to reflect on on the um, on the slideshow? On witches and envy, it's it's ironic because it's the other way around. So envy is why women are demonized, and then now they're they're calling witches the envious ones. I think that's called projection. 
That's exactly right. That's brilliant. You said that. Thank you, Margareta. Um, and that's exactly right. You know, if you don't, you don't want to look at the truth you can you rename it you call it something else and you and yeah you you get to that's that's the hypocrisy that you see again and again and again right so you know what's it's really interesting then we get um roman emperors had all of these anti-magic laws and anti-jewish edicts by the way all in place a thousand years before the 1400s started and the church didn't do anything about it they didn't use them they didn't take these i they didn't take these laws and then apply them until about 1400 why is that anybody so back to margaretta's point by 1401 the roman catholic church had a credibility problem right? All of a sudden, you've got the rise in these other ideas. We, in a, on Wednesday, we're going to look at where heretics comes from, and the first crusade comes from, and these ideas were all of a sudden, people are scratching their heads a little bit. Oh, humanism was also coming out, right? Big force. Not saying it was against religion, but suddenly questioning man is, or humans could be, you know, and maybe in charge of their own destiny a little bit, and maybe the arts and literature is okay too along with religious teachings right it had a credibility problem and it needed I, I don't use the word very often but they needed a scapegoat and so again it's this idea of um, all of these other events coming together at the same time and there are a lot of them so one of the things we're going to be talking about is is like the church realized that it was really hard to get rid of these deeply rooted traditions. And these traditions have to do with, you think about singing to plants so they'll grow, right? Running into the fields with your torches to bring, to make sure the sun is gonna shine on your crops. Like all of these deeply rooted pagan beliefs were not gonna be eliminated that easily. The other thing is, is that, so everybody like kind of like, like what Margaret was saying, the church will create the very evil that it's trying to eradicate. Because just like heroes need a monster, the church needed a target. It needed something to say, something is evil, we're gonna do something about it, and, and God is great. And so it's the, it was the easiest way for, um, for these, because of what was happening. And I just like, I wanna, I wanna dive in, but I, I think we should wait until, until Wednesday um but the the idea of silver oh yeah yeah hi cat i am having trouble remembering my timelines right um because when i did my paper on this it was my first semester of freshman year but how much of this overlaps with the inquisition which one well, that's a thing. The Spanish I mean, one? Well, the Spanish Inquisition kept going and kept going later, partially because they were, you know, the Iberian Peninsula is was so, you know, because of the uh, Pyrenees, um, Spain and Portugal was really separated from the rest of Europe at that time. And so they were behind everything, you know, reading, knowledge, art, thought, everything. But the, the papal inquisitions, weren't they earlier and kind of around the time that the witch burnings? So, yeah. So essentially, though, when we're looking at... It overlaps for one because now we're, we're it's easy to kind of like mesh it all together. Spain becomes the most powerful and richest country in Europe, right? Why? Because of the because of colonization, right? And they are they waited for the Pope, who in the late 1400s he wrote off and said, you know hey 1492 or whatever you got our permission from god and you're justified going and getting all the silver and gold and whatever else you want and with all that power power corrupts absolutely 
is, and that's what we're going to get into with colonization. We're going to be talking. I was just going to say that's when all the colonization right. started. Right. And that's also so like, but some of the very th same things in, in terms of social structure that are created during the witch hunts is then brought over and applied to colonization right? because right. Okay. So one of the things we're going to talk about, for instance, I'm, then I'll switch back is the fact that, you know, the Spanish subjects, it was Queen Isabella who said, okay, you can go over there, but everybody has to be a Christian subject. And then, and you have to be nice to them. And they went over there and women had their breasts hanging out, right? And they wouldn't stop worshiping their own gods, heavens. So that means if you can't turn them into your Christian subjects, what are they? They are literally what they would call a nation of devils. And you get to do whatever you want to them and you can enslave them. And that's what happened again so and again. And like again. A, I'm sorry to talk over you. Okay. So it's more like a domino effect. That's exactly right. Well, they also call it a boomerang effect, because guess what? Then once colonization happened and enslavement started happening or really turned into a machine that it is, we know it today, then the boomerang effect was it was like even further entrenched some of the issues going on back in in Europe, like women being uninvited into the guilds, women being uninvited into any of the medical establishments, right? All of those things were the domino effect. The other thing that, that you're probably bringing up is this idea of the age of the heretic. Before the witch hunts, there was something called, her the heretic means something that, you know, obviously people are not with the church, right? So they're against doing something in the church. These are people who are some of the different churches that were established that were Christian churches that were being established in the Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, they had women leadership. They had women that could give the sacrament. They had women and men living together. There were a lot of different things. And then the biggest one is, and they're called the Cathars, which means pure, which means live like Jesus lived, which is give away all your money. Well, the Catholic Church did not want to give away all their money. And so that was one of the big problems. So first, the heretics were men and women. But as things got rolling and it became more of a gendered event, that's when heretics mostly were, were, were women being burned and hung. And so, and again, there, there's this, one of the reasons why we have trouble with um, having a lot of detailed uh, notes and accuracies about numbers. Like I said, when I was first reading about this stuff, it was like 2 million women were burned, get it out. And now we think it's closer to 100,000 people, right? One of the problems is, is because trial documents were not kept or they were destroyed after the trial ended, right? Something like that. We're, they're finding a little bit more. And that's one of the reasons why this guy is amazing. And so you're starting to see, oh, and that's why she is amazing, right? Because we're starting to see, you know, these, these you know, things that are opening up and they're starting to discover more and more in terms of what happened um, during, these, during these trials. Um, but again, it was, it was something that, you know, we, we take so much for granted in terms of, um, you know, we can say that, yeah, it was, you know, children, it was happening to children, but 85% of the people who were persecuted were women, right? Um, and so let's see, yeah, I kind of want to stop there. I think I'm going to stop there. But um, so remember, they would have never called themselves witches. That's a term that's used by colonists, right? They also would have been, again, um, they would have been something like an empiricist. They really were reflective of early science. So a lot of physicians, uh, even like you'll hear about how like when, I mean, there used to be a lot of over overlap between midwives and physicians in different villages. But then it, as classism, right, became more and more of a thing, you started to see women who couldn't read, who were part of the peasantry, who were offering medicine, um, they were becoming less and less, you know, they were less fancy. So therefore, why not, you know, hire a family physician in the, in the, a nice coat who has a big a university degree, right? Even though he doesn't know anything. As a matter of fact, there's a story of, um, of, you know, of in the first couple hundred years. And when forceps were developed, it was because men didn't want to touch women's bodies <laughs> and they would be like, right? Like, how are you going to, okay. How, how does that work, right? And so the idea then like, in, but it was something that's been established for, you'll every once in a while, you'll see like these ideas of these historical uh, midwives and such. Uh, but yeah, I'm like, I keep not wanting to tell everybody um, 
all that I'd like to because I really want to save some for Wednesday with our breakout rooms. Hi, Ada. Who's your friend? Oh. Hi, Hi. Guess who it is? It's Madeline. Oh, cool. Hey, Madeline. <laughs> I'm like out of context. Um, <laughs> How are you doing? It was very fun. I'm always with a random person, but this time I'm with a student. But um, <laughs> Okay, no, I was just saying this. So they invented forceps because men didn't want to touch women. Well, that was also that was part of it. Like that's yeah, it's also, that's irony. Well, okay, that's so I, this, ironic. this is going to be TMI, but essentially, though, when they first developed forceps, infants were dying all the time. Uh -huh. They're just dying all the time. But yeah, uh -huh. it was part, yeah because they didn't know. I mean, it was it was awful, right? And, and it oh, took yeah. them. Yeah. And the medical yeah. establishment a long time to be able to see it as a life-saving device, right? Um, yeah. 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 Margareta? Oh, my God. If, uh, um, let's see, what was my question? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm holding <gasps> Look at that. Oh, this is... bunny. Oh. Uh, An Antonio Banderas. Oh, yes. <laughs> he's, he's I think little, that just made my day. Look at his ears. So, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. No problem. no problem. But no, I was going to say, like, if um, upper class people, I guess, had the, the doctors that they would hire from universities, uh, peasants couldn't hire them. Wouldn't that mean then that the midwives would become more popular with the peasantry? Yes, that's excellent. And you're right. And there's a few that still would have, but more and more, um, more and more, there would have been such stories told about them so like for instance the the women who still wanted to use birth control right the women who still wanted to be able to help other women limit how many children they were having so so much of what these midwives were doing was against church practices um and so like there was a and and, and you're talking also about a time that is okay so when the magna carta was developed and then there was this, also this thing called oh shoot what is it called it was something like the the plans of the the forest treaty or something like that older women could inherit some maybe almost half of their husband's property when or their husband's wealth when the husband died so widows were you know kind of taken care of also begging and sleeping on church benches was allowed. But then by the time of um, by the time of the early modern era, all of those practices were eradicated. You have all of these new ideas of the pauperization of the working class, the criminalization of the working class. Suddenly you have this in the that's where classism really comes in. The idea of homeless really sets in. You think about the beautiful places like in Venice and stuff, but there are thousands of homeless families on the street. So like you've got a completely different mindset of who and what people are. You, women are being teased about being poor. Women are being like, and now with classism, you think that the only way to get have knowledge is through this this one this one means in terms of like medicine or whatever. And you've also got the university and the, the church and the university are going hand in hand. So you've got three powers here. You've got the nobility, you've got the state, and you've got the church. And so that's why the witch the witch phenomenon is a state sponsored campaign of terror that existed for 400 years. And and we don't really talk about it very much like this women's Holocaust or whatever. But now you all understand kind of why it makes me crazy when people in politics, especially male politicians, say that, that there's a witch hunt against them. Because that's not true. <laughs> it is not true. So, yes, you would think that, I mean, we would hope that there would still be, but you think about these these granny women, right? Sooner or later, the generations die out too, and their access um, and and the trust that existed. That's what I mean about gossip, right? So there was trust having someone, but they were all literally erased over time. So the demonization was coming from all sides, not just from like the top, but from all over. Yeah, and the other thing we're going to talk about again on Wednesday, if I can save any part of this without telling you all everything, is the fact that there's something called primitive accumulation. Does anybody know what that is? Tell us, Kat, what is primitive accumulation? 
I was actually laughing at the Wednesday part and being able to save it all. Um, <laughs> but um, while I've never heard that exact term, I can take a stab at it just from context. Um, the fact that the more you say something, the more people believe it. And the more people believe it, they tell other people and then it spreads and it just becomes accepted widely as being true whether or not that happens to be a fact that's right that's right and but um yeah thank you bravo and that's actually exactly what's happened in terms of like there needed to be this huge overhaul in in the worker which is called the proletariat and this gets into some marxist thinking which we're not going to really get into in this class you'll hear me talk a little bit about it but it's essentially this uh, since the magna carta since these time right around the middle ages um there was something called the common lands. And around the early modern era, um, there started to be these land enclosures and land grabs, when all of a sudden there were less and less places where all the common folk, the peasantry, was up until then was allowed to hunt and fish and gather wood, so they would not freeze or starve to death suddenly all of the land started being enclosed by the early modern era especially this is one of the things that was that the peasant revolts were all about was land enclosure and so little by little the common lands and the common lands is really what held this was like their living room this is where their banquet room was this is where so much was happening again tethered to the land right women especially women healers had access to their own little plot of a garden where they could grow their plants and herbs so after you've got these land grabs suddenly if someone is in a position of power like at the manor and they take they take an interest in one person they take away that midwife's garden and gives it to their cow that midwife is going to be like pointing a finger at them that's not fair that was my garden i don't know how i'm i'm not gonna have a livelihood anymore if that person she was pointing her finger at got sick who are you going to blame, right? So you see all these intricacies at work. We'll talk definitely more. Primitive accumulation is early capitalism, y'all. It's all about real estate. And unfortunately, that was one of the great downfalls of the of the woman as healer. Um, so yeah, so good. Um, and what's the other thing about Salem, about your paper that's going to be due this week? Don't say it. <laughs> okay, thank you, Kat. Yes, why not? An A, Andrew, somebody. Salem came like way after all of this, right? That's right. Way after, exactly. Like late. It, and it's, you know, it, it was kind of like a leftover thought, really. Uh, and for the people who were the, the colonizers coming over off the Mayflower or whatever, who were trying to put together a new structure, they they came because they wanted to be like religiously the Puritans are just that, right? They wanted to be in a more extreme place of religion. Um, and so that's why they were kind of reviving some of the whole stuff about women, the devil, beasts, the idea of animals, you know, being evil, all that kind of stuff. Um, and anybody practicing a religion that wasn't your own was devilish, right? And you can see how that is reflected in our world today, everywhere. So, um, yeah, so we'll talk about, okay, I will show you this one other thing I was going to, since we started talking about uh, primitive accumulation. Wow, how do I bring this up? Hmm, how do I bring this up? Let's see, okay, hold on one second. I want you all to start um, thinking about how, when you see memes, can you see this over here, Margareta Cat, the yellow? When you thank you when you see these kind of memes now on all of your social media i want us to start asking these questions like in a way like for, you know before you took this class you'd be like you see that and oh it's pretty embroidery or maybe and maybe i agree with it but you don't exactly know how to say how or why so i want i want you to start like and, and bring some with you on wednesday or from now on the rest you know the last next few weeks Bring these ideas because you see these like, yeah, go sisterhood or whatever. I, I want us to be able to unpack. I want us to be able to interrogate why they might might or might not be true, right? Um, okay. 
that's essentially it. That's all I got today. And so anybody think about their final yet? Miranda is. Hi, Miranda and friends. <laughs> you want to tell us later what you're doing for your final? I already briefly discussed it earlier with the whole like asexuality and like figuring that out. For That's right. Thing, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, you're fine. You're good. Apologies. Just like, yeah. no, but yeah, I talked about briefly like looking into that and like how could I connect it with like the class and like figuring out how to connect it. Sorry, and yeah. I can't wait to learn from you because we need some good scholarship, some good literature on this stuff. So I'll be really curious about what you, what you find for sure. Anybody else? I'm not sure exactly, but um, for inspiration, I was going to go at one point to the excavation site of uh, Vincha, where they have all the where the civilization was for the in the Balkans here, and uh, see if I can get some inspiration there. Like go on a tour, see what more I can find that's very specific. Um, Are you? Go ahead. Yeah, tie it back. To, to try to tie it back somehow to today. Yes. Are you actually talking about being able to go on a physical tour in person where you are? Yeah. Yeah, it's like an hour or two away from me. Oh my God, that would be so wonderful. And we would definitely really appreciate like some kind of like, you know, take some video and then share it with the class kind of stuff. And Oh, definitely. I would love that. We actually like, um, they throw those potsherds away. It, we used to have some like and really, really old pieces of sculpture. They're like, it's so old, um, but people throw them away. They literally, there are so many of them, they find them in their backyard and they like chuck them in the trash. Wow. That's so, amazing. Yeah, find them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you bring some, make a little collection for yourself or something, if they're throwing them in the trash, I mean, I guess they might belong in a museum, but it doesn't seem like, I don't know, people are thinking that's a necessity, I guess. Right. Cause there's so many. It, it's not in their conscious. That's, that's what I was saying. Like the, I think a couple of classes ago, it's like the, people just don't think about it. They're not that's thinking that it's valuable. Oh, that's right. Oh, okay. Well, good luck. We can't wait to see what you're, what you find, what you come up with. Anyone else? So if you, if you want to bounce some ideas off of me, please reach out. We can meet over Zoom, um, just a couple minutes, just brainstorm a little bit. Also, um, what else was I going to say? I think that, um, you know, after this week, oh yeah. So, as we get closer, I think the way the modules are now, we've kind of got, you know, the last week of school or so is kind of a mishmash of the quiz and all that. We'll probably have to use all the class time because whether you're doing a paper presentation, showing us your, you know, tour journey, whatever you're doing for your final, um, I, I still would love for everyone to take a, a, min a minute or two. If it's a presentation, that's one thing. But if it's a paper, just discussing what your paper is is about. You don't have to have it finished either. Just sort of reflecting on on where you're going with your with your with your final. Does that make sense for people? I hope so. Cool. All right, good. Well, it's nice to see you all. Uh, hold on, Bunny, Texas, Bloodletting and Leeches. Oh yeah, Willow Bark. Very nice. Thanks, Cat. Yeah. I'm familiar with that too. Good. I can't wait to share more of these this uh, stuff on the witch phenomenon with you all on Wednesday. It's all I could do to just not tell everything. It's a lot to share, I know. Um, cool. Well, thank you very much. And I will see you all on Wednesday. Have a great couple of days. Be safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.